Good morning. I'm about to ask the You can sit here, just in case I say something wrong. <laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll correct me. Thank you for coming. Um, I uh, revised my presentation since Dr. Priest took half of it last night, um, which is great. I had plenty to say. So uh, let's uh, talk about this topic. I'm glad that you've all come. And I'm really glad this is my home city. I'm really glad to have my African colleagues here from all over Africa. Um, it was great to have them at AIU um, with us there in my other home. So uh, thank you and especially welcome to my African colleagues, even though I, I've only been here a week now or two. <laughs> but uh, good to have you here. So um, this is our topic. i just tell you a little bit of my story. Um, this is around the funeral. I went to so many funerals of children and others and suffered myself. We were sick 40 times the first year we were in Tanzania. Um, this is my family. Uh, my daughter is sitting in the back there. That's the older one there. But uh, some of the older kids are here um, with me. But 20 years ago, I went to East Africa, Tanzania. And um, let me give a little bit of theory because I was confused enough from my eight and a half years in Tanzania to say, I need to understand African or Tanzanian, especially worldview, better. So I went off to Trinity to try to figure out what that was. I took a class from Paul Hebert in transforming worldviews and some other good classes like that. And uh, then I went back to try to research it. Of course, Bob Priest's thing was worldview is a nice idea, but how do you research it? Um, so um, one of Hebert's, so I'll give you a little piece of theory here. One of Hebert's things, many of you have seen in Spoke Religions book, other places, what do we do to respond to people who are suffering or other kinds of things? We can say no. Um, as we talked about, this leads to syncretism. Somebody said in Congo, one of my students said, he had never heard a sermon on witchcraft in his whole time. One of them said he remembered once when he was 14. But outside of church, immediately you're outside of church, is what everybody talks about. So when we say no and it's just suspicion, when we say yes and it becomes part of the church, that's again, leads to syncretism. That's, that's uh, Hebert's point, and his response is we have to look at life and understand it li well, phenomenology, what's happening, and then this is on Ted Ward's rail fence, so if those of you who are education people, you can um, start with life, what's true, test with the Bible and reality, and then evaluate it, and then how do we get to transformative ministry? So um, Hebert's can't just look at one system. Most of us, if we're doctors, we only look at chemicals, in the body, if we're associate or anthropologists, we might look here. If we're pastors, we try to deal with what are the demons or the angels or whatever's going on, jinn, ancestors. Um, his piece of culture, um, what we see is this. What we don't know is what's behind it. And research helped me get at some of what was behind what I was seeing. Um, but it comes from experience. Worldview is the assumptions inside of each of those levels the foundational, cognitive, affective, evaluative assumptions and frameworks a group of people make about the nature of reality which they use to order their lives. It's a map that describes reality but also tells you how to get where you need to go. It's not what you think about but what you think with, what you feel with, what you fear with, what you love with. And in the causality dimension of what causes things, that's definitely true as well. For example, in the U.S., we tend to think about bodies as mechanical things and anything we try to make things happen if you're sick somebody says what do you have and what did you do about it and did you take any drugs even in the narthex of the church they're unlikely to lay hands on you and pray for you why well it's a part of our worldview in tanzania people think in terms of relationships organically we this was in the film last night about bdiaco i think said um there's relationships and disrelationships um, so everything is about relationships in Tanzania. Um, a little of my research, I used the critical contextualization method of those four steps, went to uh, four different classes and also a number of churches and walked people through that, lots of interviews, lots of participant observation over three years. Um, this is a very brief summary of what I came up with. Basically, you heard Bob talk about last night interpersonal causation. So, he or she made me sick, or you made yourself sick like Job, or it made you sick. Um, now, in the biomedical system in the West, this is where all the emphasis is. Germs, it, that makes you sick. Notice that box is empty. But in Tanzania, it's all about who she or 
he or she made you sick. Now, not traditionally it's, or Neil traditionally, because it keeps changing, it's all about witches. Every time somebody gets sick or dies, people want to know who did it. Um, within the Pentecostal system, it's about guvza giza, powers of darkness, which may include witches, but especially focuses on demons and spirits of various kinds. Um, I won't explain the rest of this, but uh, who is a witch? We talked about this last night. Bob gave you an introduction. Important to, now, this is the Tanzanian context, okay? Even uh, the Azande are different. They have witches and sorcerers. They, they're, it's different. There are African groups that don't have any witches. There are a variety of things, but basically in Tanzania, you have an Mganga and Mchawi, the traditional healer, versus the person that's a traditional healer is going to tell you caused it. So half of the time, according to one person, you go to an Mganga, um, he is going to diagnose your situation and say, who did it to you? Um, what happens then with your response to that person? There's, if, as long as you get better, it's no problem. But if you don't get better, if things continue to be a problem, this is a, a chart that Bob talked about our survey at AIU. Um, bad things happen to you. You get beaten up, you get chased away, you get ignored. Um, and in Tanzania and other places, you might get killed. So according to the Human Rights Survey, uh, 10 times a week in eight of the regions in Tanzania over five years, ending in 2009, someone was killed because they were suspected of being a witch. One of my students did further research on that and he came up with, he went through the Mwanza files and came up with 70 cases a year in a different, little bit different period, more recent. Um, so even if it's half of that, that specifically said witch. Now those are the ones that got to the police station. He also went out to a village where there were a number of graves in the last 18 months. Only one of them was at the police station. So um, in any case, similar to England in the real bewitching times. And also only 10 of the 10 percent of those cases listed a su suspect and only three of them or four had been to court. Um, I don't know if anyone was convicted. So you're much more dangerous to be accused of being a witch than to cut someone up with a panga or uh, a uh, machete who is a witch. Because if you do that you won't probably go to jail or anything will happen. But if you're accused of being a witch, good chance something might happen. So what's true? I'm not going to go through this very quickly because basically Bob covered all this. Um, what are the other social outcomes and causes of which accusation? Um, is our translations correct? Is there a biblical example of an evil person causing harm to another person through invisible means? We have good people like Moses and uh, Elijah and other people who announce God's judgment and people die. But is there an evil person? Um, how do we know someone's an Mchawi? How do we know that Wachawi caused harm? Well, I'll leave this one to Kunyap. How, should we trust Waganga? Um, what, is, what if the Mganga claims to be a prophet or a pastor? Um, I'm just going to give you, this is a pastor, a student of mine, who used to be an Mganga, showing you what he used to do. Um, so you made the dawah yourself, you made the medicine yourself, you put it on, and uh, then you suck out the stone that the witch put into the body of the person. Sorry, I put this too loud in Swahili. Then you do it again. He's demonstrating on his wife what he used to do. Um, you suck out the stone. And a, and a stone came out. Now I take some other medicine and put on. You go and tomorrow, you slept well, you bring me money. We finish, and you feel you, you slept well, you'll bring me money tomorrow. So this stone, I put inside my mouth. You can't see them. I put in here. Is there anything there? See, is he a healer or is he not a healer? Because I don't have anything in my mouth. This is what we do as witch doctors to make some money. Or not witch doctor is the wrong word. Traditional healer. Okay. Um, so 
it was very interesting in class because I had a younger student saying, no, this is really what happens. I, we prayed for somebody and a stone came out. And this guy was sitting there and said, nah, that's not what happens. I used to be a traditional healer. We know how to do that stuff. And people would say stuff. He said, yeah, we, we have networks. We know what's happening with people. Um, in any case, disturbingly, um, the person who planted 40 churches in this area, he died and the, uh, went to, to help the grieving widow a couple weeks uh, after that. And as everyone was leaving, she took me by the hand and pulled me back by the bedroom and said, now, don't trust the pastor because he put something into, he killed my husband. What am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> uh, he's the, he's the, runs our Bible school. He's the, he's the pastor who took over who was given the church by her husband. Um, eventually, I reported it to somebody who they found out that some random person, a carpenter who came over and prophesied over this Mze before he died, said that he envy this person, wanted his position, blah, blah, blah. Um, he wasn't even part of the church. He had no credentials. The, the older man dismissed it, but his wife grabbed onto it. And this pastor had to do the funeral. He showed up and walked in, and knowing that the whole family suspects him of having killed the... Uh, anyways, that's in, in the area near Rwanda, Burundi. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so what can we do? Transforming ministry. We can listen to whole stories. I, what I did with my research was I mostly listened to stories. Because when people tell a story, you don't have to ask them, what's your worldview? They, it doesn't work. <laughs> listen to the story, figure it out if you have enough stories. Um, it really changed me. Okay? One of the things I found out is that researchers get changed. We're going to talk about changing a little bit. But uh, um, lead some critical contextualization discussions, like he talked about. Hinfalar in Zambia has had some success. He's a... Catholic priest been there for 40 years. They did things in all the systems of systems. They had the police come in. They, they uh, had a former Waganga show their tricks like this. They did various things, and they found some real success in reducing persecutions and accusations. Although people still said, but what are we going to do if the, if the witches are still around? <laughs> Didn't work so well with belief. Do res uh, research on your own community, whatever that is, because it's different in every place. Research the Bible deeply. What does the Bible really say? Not just is there a word that's translated as which, therefore everything we ever knew is true, and likewise with anything else, but what does the Bible really say about it? Tell true, holy, loving stories about trusting God, about things that people have done, about uh, the stories in the Bible, about taking care of Ruth, how that's different from, I, I had our choir, read through the story of Ruth. And, and beforehand, I talked about some widows I knew and how they had been treated um, as su suspected witches. And then we talked about the contrast there. Um, train pastors to be holistic healers in an integrated system of systems in all those areas so that they can respond at least somewhat or at least refer in each system. One of my, one of my pastor friends, his wife was sick for seven years. He went to this clinic and that one and here and there. Finally, somebody took long enough to listen to him to say, I think it's hookworm. They had to treat it several times. It got better. But he didn't know enough, could have had a little bit of public health to know that himself. Now, he got training, so when somebody in his congregation came and said, now, you know, this is, this is not a regular sickness. I, you need to go, we'll give you a cow to go to the traditional healer. 80% go to the traditional healer first. But we won't give you a chicken to go to the clinic. He said, I think I know what it is. L let me take you to this person. Um, but that's just a little piece. We also need to train them in good theology. If we haven't even been talking about it, one of the students who went back to that same village, people said, how do you have the courage to talk about this? He talked about, nobody wants to talk about it. Everybody's afraid to talk about it. They're afraid to talk about who the witch is, something might happen. Um, Train pastors to respond to the sickness and the fear and the suspicions and accusations of church members because it's happening in the, in the church. Um, some transformation possibilities. So my, I started looking for <laughs> worldview, right? I moved toward sickness and death. I found out some causes, but the real question was, who did it? So what about witchcraft? I don't know. Like Bob said, the Bible doesn't really give us real 
explicit discussion. It doesn't say it occurs. It doesn't say it doesn't occur. But it does talk a lot about suffering and some other causes. Um, but the real question to me is, what do we do about the people who are accused? So um, this is uh, a modification I've made of Hebert's thing. He liked it. Follow some um, adult education stuff. Experiences lead us to a culture in particular things. If we can have new experiences, like Kunyap says, we've heard thousands of stories about witches, and that's why we believe in it. If we can have new stories, if we can tell new things, if we can have different kinds of things, maybe we'll have a different... Now, um, this happens also for... This was just a small group of 27 medical personnel, mostly Americans who I talked to. Notice that their time in Africa had moved them to be much more believing in the possibility of witchcraft harming people. Um, so the people who had been there less than 10 years, um, none of them said some people have supernatural ability to kill other people through witchcraft. But a third of the ones who had been there more than 10 years said yes. Now this wasn't a very big sample, not much can be made of it. Um, so I went back to Tanzania and we did some seminars. Um, this is what I've begun to do some things. We're, to me, it needs to be done at every level, okay? I think this is an important level. We need to discuss it. And one of the things that's important about this level is we need to have people from different worldviews and cultures and backgrounds, different parts of Africa, talk to each other. Because one of the things about a critical contextualization discussion, if everyone is in the same place, we don't get as far. Because nobody challenges my assumptions because we all share the assumptions. Um, but if I'm having critical contextualization discussions in Tanzania, I'm changed. Um, maybe I changed a little bit. Anyway, this was <clears throat> brought some people together. We started out with a simple question. Um, what's the ideal village? A good village, what would it be like? And then we said, what's the current state of your village? And then what are the barriers to get to that ideal village? And what are the helps to get to that ideal village? And as we talked about that, people came up with various things. Well, one of the things that a, a guy who was an FM radio announcer in this particular circle I'm showing you came up with was Usiache Mamam Chawi Kuishi, do not let the woman witch live. He said Tanzania has its constitution and the UN has its constitution, all this stuff about human rights, but we have our constitution. It says don't let the woman witch live. That's our problem. That's what we need to do and to deal with it. Now, I was uh, a little concerned because I knew that in the group were a number of people who'd been accused because I had welcomed them to the seminar. Um, in fact, the day before that, well, let me, let me go on here. Um, this was in the seminar, who is accused? So these are people who, I said, okay, so who's been accused of witchcraft? Um, let's take a picture of, of you all. This is toward the end of the seminar. These people all came up. What's interesting is that all of the deans that I work with, the top regional overseers of the church, are in this picture, except one. I asked him later, he said, oh yeah, I have been, I, I, know, I don't know, I just didn't get in the picture. Um, so all of the top leaders of the church had been accused. But um, what's different about these guys, these pastors, this, this is the one who was accused in the story I just told you about, these guys are, this is the one whose who's, uh, wife I told you about, these guys are socially powerful. They have social capital. They are not likely to have much harm happen as long as they are, you know, well connected in the community. People will hear that, but they'll dismiss it. Nothing will happen to them. On the other hand, these people were not socially powerful, widows, separated, and they had some very harmful things happen to them. They had to give a cow because of, of a nephew dying. They had to, um, this woman is sitting with her pastor. She, um, she came back and she was accused, basically her, they gave her some land after she left her family, came back home. Nephew didn't like that. He accused her of being a witch and did some terrible things to her. Um, she says that blew over because the family settled it, but she said, when I come to church, no one will sit on the same bench with me, even now. Some people spit before they greet me. Um, so, 
This woman, I was preaching the, the day before the seminar I just showed you. Yep. Um, and she, uh, after I, got, I sat by her, I knew who she was because she was the, she'd been in ministry for 49 years, now 50 years. Um, her, her son was the assistant pastor. Her husband has been a regional overseer all this time. Um, after I finished, she said, you know, thank you for that sermon. I was um, chased out of my village two months ago. As far as I know, she still hasn't gone back. She was surrounded by people with knives and stones, and, um, and I can tell you the whole story behind it um, of issues with her daughter-in-law, etc. But what has changed from critical contextualization discussions and research is my preaching. At least I'm touching on things that people get up next to me and said that really made a difference for me. Um, so uh, what is true, what is loving? Um, we need to look at scripture. This is it, small groups in that time. Um, Exodus 22, 18 to 24. Um, what happens to the accused? I, what I was preaching that day was actually a sermon that was preached in the 1600s in England when things changed. And a man said, when a widow comes to your door and you turn her away and then your child gets sick, don't say that the widow bewitched your child. God is judging you because you turned a widow away. And what happens is this verse that says, don't let the woman which live, two, two verses later it says, don't have any other gods, don't go to any other sources. And then it says, if you harm the alien or the widow or the orphan, I will bring the panga, the machete, to your house. And I will judge you for doing that. So I said, maybe our problems are not because of witches. Maybe our problems are because of what we're doing to widows and orphans. Um, so, and I won't go into to, uh, his experiences. Questions. I think we have a few minutes for questions.